This is History Myths and Myth Conceptions. And today's myth is Spartacus, Abolitionist and Socialist. There is a more or less established tradition of presenting Spartacus as some sort of a noble hero fighting against oppression. And an abolitionist, since he was a leader of the slave uprising, after all. This interpretation of Spartacus is especially dominant in popular culture, and as a result, that's how he is often perceived by the general audience. Also, this kind of interpretation is very inaccurate and largely based not on history, but on socialist propaganda and mythology. To put things simply, it is essentially a Soviet version of Spartacus popularized by Hollywood, which we will explain shortly. But first, we must say a couple of words about the historical Spartacus. We don't know who he was and even not sure where he came from and what his background was before he became a gladiator. It is usually reported that he was a Hellenized Thracian, but it is also possible that he wasn't from Thrace, but just fought in the role of a Thracian in the arena. Ancient professional wrestlers had their specializations, and one of them was called a Thracian. The information given by Lucius Aeneas Florus that Spartacus was enslaved as a punishment for his desertion and he used to be a Roman soldier back then, sounds believable. Spartacus successfully demonstrated that he knew a thing or two about warfare, which hints at a military background. The version of Appian that Spartacus was fighting against Romans and later became a prisoner of war makes sense for exactly the same reason. We don't know the causes of the rebellion led by Spartacus and also its goals. There are theories. For example, a quite pointless movement of the army in the direction of North Italy is explained sometimes as an indication that Spartacus wanted to join forces with the rebel general Quintus Sertorius, which actually explains a lot, including why the army turned back when the news of the assassination of Sertorius arrived. But Spartacus was never an abolitionist, as we understand this word right now. Nobody was an abolitionist in the period of antiquity. Not even the slave philosopher Epictetus. Discussion of the slavery in the ancient world is not within the scope of this video, and this is a very complicated subject. In short, Greek and especially Roman intellectuals were humanists and apparently thought that slavery was, uh, let's call it, a suboptimal practice. But what should you do? What are the alternatives given the time and the structure of society? Kind of like many modern people think that imprisonment of human beings is also a suboptimal decision. But yeah, what are your suggestions? And now we're done with the historical Spartacus and we can travel in time. Because Spartacus wasn't really an important character up until the 19th century. And then suddenly he found himself becoming some sort of a cultural symbol. First, he became an ancient revolutionary. The French even erected a statue of Spartacus in 1830. Then some of the links with abolitionism started to appear. Karl Marx mentioned him in his works, and this is very important for our story. Spartacus became a proletarian hero. Another significant and probably even one of the most significant milestones in this myth-building happened in the year 1874, when Raffaello Giovagnoli published his pseudo-historical book Spartaco, which was apparently influenced by both socialist ideas and the concept of reunification of Italy. His Spartacus became the savior of the slaves, an abolitionist, a martyr, and a saint of biblical proportions. 
This book is not very well known in the English-speaking countries, but over time, a few decades later, it became a bestseller in places where it mattered the most, in the Soviet Union. Spartacus became a symbol of ancient class warfare, a proto-socialist, a revolutionary hero. The Soviet regime started promoting Spartacus in this capacity shortly after the October Revolution. Erection of his statues was seriously discussed by Lenin himself. There is also at least one song from this period, to be more precise from the early 1930s, which explicitly calls the Bolsheviks the followers of Spartacus. It is actually based on a German political song, but it is a separate story. There was even a Nazi song based on the same material. Here is the fragment of the song. Giovannioli was widely published and based on his interpretation of Spartacus. Well, there were sports societies named after Spartacus. And it is known for a fact that the name was suggested because the founders of the first sports society really liked Giovannioli's book and it was considered ideologically appropriate. That's why it was approved by the government officials. There are dozens of sports teams named after Spartacus in the former Eastern Bloc countries, and uh, these teams exist up to this day. The most famous is the association football club Spartak Moscow, one of the most popular and successful teams in the history of both Soviet and Russian football. Meanwhile, in the United States, the American writer Howard Fast writes his novel Spartacus in 1951, inspired by his time in prison and personal struggles, and also inspired by the fact that he was a member of the Communist Party of the United States of America, which led him to prison in the first place. We don't know if Howard Fast ever read Raffaello Giovannioli, but he was fully aware of the socialist mythology surrounding Spartacus and had a general idea of what was going on in his beloved Soviet Union, where the communists were building heaven on earth, and were partially successful. At least a few millions of Russians were actually sent to heaven as a result of this process. Almost a decade later, a blacklisted screenwriter Dalton Trumbo adapts Fast's novel into a screenplay. The year 1960, saw the release of the film Spartacus, directed by Stanley Kubrick and starring Kirk Douglas. This movie became a cultural phenomenon and inspired all of the film and TV adaptations of the life of Spartacus, which came after. Kubrick's Spartacus obviously emphasized this idea of abolitionism, which was quite an important subject in the US since the country has a remarkable history of slavery and technically racial segregation wasn't even outlawed yet during the time of the movie's release. So yeah, it was still a thing, and actually it is still a thing in the US, and Americans are happy to share the burden of their collective guilt with any person who happened to have a more or less pale skin pigmentation even if the person in question lived all of their life in Iceland and saw black people only on TV. The question of oppressed minorities, including African Americans, was obviously very important for the socialist and communist ideologies as well. And in fact, uh, the Soviet regime really liked to address this issue to a point when the systemic discrimination of black people in the US was used as some sort of a combo breaker in the dialogue of the two ideological systems. 
you attack the totalitarian Soviet regime, you get an accusation of being a racist and a former slave owner. This kind of exchanges and accusations, by the way, occasionally had very interesting developments. For example, in 1980, the Soviet Union became the first country in the world to send a person of African descent into space. So yeah, the Soviet Union had a black cosmonaut, despite the fact that the black population of the country was something like 10 people. They just borrowed him from Cuba because they had a point to prove in the ideological battle. So Arnaldo Tamayo Mendes became not only the first black person in space, but also the first Latin American in space. As a result of all of this, the image of Spartacus, the abolitionist, is still dominating the media. The problem here is that it is not historically accurate. It's a myth. 